Welcome, everybody. So glad to have you again, uh, those who have joined us before and for new folks coming in to join us for a virtual lunchbox talk of the North Carolina Botanical Garden. We want to let you know that we are recording this webinar for future viewing through our website and we've missed seeing everybody and missed seeing you all at the garden. Wanted to let you know our next virtual lunchbox talk will be with our own botanical gardens, Nick Adams. He's the Battle Park Natural Area Manager. He'll be talking about restoring open woodlands and natural areas from the perspective of a natural areas manager. And of course, he'll approach it through a lens of wildflowers to continue in our year of the wildflower focus on biodiversity. So I want to introduce myself. Uh, I am Joanna Lalikas, the Education Director at the Botanical Garden. And Ben Tupper is also with us to share in the moderation of this webinar. Ben is our Public Programs Coordinator. You'll hear from him momentarily. So with that, um, I've included a link and I'll add it again for those who are coming in a little bit um, after the beginning of the session, I'll add it shortly to our events page so you can register for our next Lunchbox Talks. And I also wanna put a plug in to consider attending the Garden's annual event, which will be happening virtually this year, our Carolina Moonlight Virtual Party. It's an event that's open to all uh, and we'll encourage all to make a donation to benefit the North Carolina Botanical Garden as well. Uh, those, do those donations will provide resources for us to continue to protect, preserve, and conserve our natural heritage, sustaining the garden's operations into the future. And that's June 6th at 7 p.m. It'll go for an hour and a half, and I'll post that link just momentarily. I'll add too that we are very interested in how we can meet your needs through our mission virtually while we're still staying at home uh, and into the new normal moving forward. So feel free to email me or Ben um, to, to share your ideas. We'll also be directing you to a survey at the end of this lunchbox talk where you can share your ideas and thoughts there as well. So. Uh, before moving into the webinar with our own Johnny Randall, we'd just like to make sure everyone understands the Zoom platform that we're working within, and Ben is going to walk through that with you now. Sure, thanks Joanna. So, hi everyone. Um, as most of you might be aware, um, Zoom is becoming a part of everyday life, it seems, uh, here with everything going on in the world. So, I'll just give a brief overview of how Zoom webinar works. It works a little bit different than Zoom meetings, as you've already probably figured out when you joined. Um, your audio and video are muted by default. Um, so I'm going to go through just how um, the Zoom webinar dashboard works. So our audio, our audio settings will be down in the bottom left hand corner. And this is where um, you can click that carrot menu if your sound's not coming through, if you can't hear us properly. You can pick different speakers if you have those attached. Um, the chat bubble down here, chatting allows you to interact with other attendees and the panelists and ourselves as moderators. So in the chat, you can, this is a great place to ask for technical support if you can't hear us or if something else is going on um, from a technical standpoint, feel free to chat in and I can chat back to you directly. Um, be aware though that the chat, if you are sending a chat to another attendee, all the panelists can see that by default. So just be aware that um, everyone uh, who is a panelist and moderator can see what you're chatting. So the raise hand feature, this is gonna be used in our webinar mainly as an accessibility feature um, for folks who don't feel comfortable typing a question. We'll also use the raise your hand feature probably at the end of this webinar when we open up questions for, uh, for Johnny. So if you raise your hand this notifies ourselves as moderators um, that you would like to go live with your audio and ask a question to Johnny. So if your hand is raised, I might either chat you personally uh, to see what your question is, or at the end of it, I might be unmuting you so you can ask your question directly to Johnny. Uh, the Q&A, this is where the main interface will be for questions that you might have. Um, so this can be with your name attached, or you can ask these anonymously as well. Um, so in the Q&A, I can 
Joanna or myself can either type an answer if it's something that Johnny's already covered, um, or we'll kind of just keep a log of your questions. And when we get to a nice stopping point, um, we'll bring those up with Johnny um, so he can um, attend to all of those. So these are the main controls that you have as attendees uh, for a Zoom webinar. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. So we'd like to know who is all at the table, uh, so to speak, and we'll be using the chat and a polling option. And this is uh, an op opportunity for you to get familiar with the polls because we'll be offering a few during Johnny's lecture. So Ben will put up uh, the first poll and we're interested in, are you joining us from the Toronto of North Carolina? If not, please enter where you're coming from, where you're joining us from in the chat. I'll give you just a couple more seconds to enter your response in the little radio button, if you haven't already. Looks like most folks are in the triangle area, but we have a few folks from outside. Blackstock, South Carolina. Welcome, Mitzi. Anybody else? Buncombe County Mountains. Wonderful. Really glad to have you all with us. Archdale, North Carolina, High, High Point, North Carolina. So glad to have you all be able to join us this way. So, all right. We'll close that poll. And we're ready to introduce you, Johnny. So Johnny Randall, he's waving to you now, joining us from his home. He is our Director of Conservation Programs at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. He has a bachelor's in biology from uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, has master's and PhD from Virginia Tech, and spent 10 years as a faculty member uh, at Salem College, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and the University of North Florida. He joined the Botanical Garden in 1998, and also serves as adjunct faculty at UNC Chapel Hill. His passions and research interests are in plant reproductive ecology, rare plant biology, and conservation biology, and he oversees our beautiful natural areas, which have remained open while our main garden has been closed and a great opportunity to get out in nature. Uh, and he also oversees and administers the rare plant programs. He is current president of the North Carolina Exotic Pest Plant Council, and he'll share some more with you about exotic uh, invasive plants in his talk today in my lifetime. Johnny, well, ready, ready for you to share your screen. Okay. Uh, I am the um, past president of the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council. Uh, that may be an old um, bio info. Let's see, come on slideshow, there we go. So how does that look, Joanna? Good. Oh, you're, or never mind. It probably work is working fine. It looks um, good. It says invasion curve. Yep, and that is not right. So everybody, close their eyes while I go back to the my first slide. Okay. So, um, the way I got interested in. Uh, this talk or, or putting together this talk was um, a few months ago I was thinking about all of the invasive plants that I have seen become so um, in my lifetime. So I'm about to turn 65 years old um, and so I'm going to go through some of the plants that I think are most important um, or at least um, I have plucked out of all the ones that have become invasive. So this is not what we want Chapel Hill to look like or anywhere to look like. Uh, this is uh, Rockingham, North Carolina and sort of an iconic picture of kudzu 
Um, I will not be talking about kudzu today. It has been around for uh, longer than my lifetime, um, but nonetheless is uh, one of the poster children, uh, as it were, for invasive plants, the vine that ate the south. Um, but first, I want to just talk about um, our garden a little bit. Uh, some of you um, probably are pining away, uh, hopefully, um, that you haven't been able to visit. Um, this is probably uh, the most fantastic spring I've ever seen because of all the rain and the cooler temperatures. Um, so it has been um, a marvelous spring at the garden, and it's a real shame that you haven't been able to enjoy it. Um, but do visit our webpage often. Lots of pictures are posted as well as other uh, social media like Instagram, uh, etc. So just some scenes around the garden, uh, since you can't see it. Um, but um, I'm glad Joanna mentioned the um, Carolina Moonlight Gala. This was the gala a couple of years ago. Um, and again, a real shame that that's not going to happen on site. But an exciting gala is planned virtually. So um, please plan to attend that. You can find all the information on our, our website. Uh, many of you know that we are a conservation garden. Um, I'm not going to read my slides uh, for the most part. Um, and because this is being recorded, um, you can go back and look at these things. And if you don't want to listen to an entire hour um, of me talking um, through these, um, you can get in touch with me um, personally. Uh, my email is on the uh, Botanical Garden website, and I'll send you a PDF of this presentation so you can, um, so you don't have to busily scratch down notes. Um, so, um, on to the talk, and it's kind of, um, it was coincidental that when I was thinking about putting this talk together that um, the, the first real documentation of the Carolinas was done in just about the time frame um, when I started to pay attention to plants um, between 1956 and 1964. And here's a, uh, uh, what a lot of people's manual of the vascular flora of the Carolinas looks like. Um, it had very poor bindings, and, um, but at any rate, uh, many of those fell apart. Mine is held together with duct tape, um, even though I typically use Allen Weekly's flora now. But here's me in 1960. Um, at my grandmother's in a bed of flux. So that will be, um, this is my reference for the talk. Many plants have become invasive uh, since uh, in my lifetime, and I will only talk about the ones here that have an asterisk, and there probably are additional ones. These are just ones I plucked out that would fit on a slide at one time. So uh, plants have become invasive um, uh, many plants have become invasive in my lifetime. And it wouldn't be fair to leave out the animals or the pests and pathogens, um, animals, fungi, bacteria, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm not gonna go through any of these, but just wanna point out all the things that have become invasive in my lifetime outside of plants. So one thing I like to ask people is, are exotic plants innocent until proven guilty? Um, and another way of looking at this is through the precautionary principle. So the person taking, or the organization, whatever, uh, taking a particular action should ensure that that action is not going to be harmful. And um, that, those are good rules to live by um, in many different areas. Um, so in terms of definitions of what invasive is and what exotic is, um, I just went to the internet and pulled up, uh, uh, typed in invasion um, or invasive. And uh, these are the kinds of things that came up. Uh, so uh, it's pretty clear what invasion means. It's usually not a good thing. Um, but when I looked up exotic, um, of course I didn't post everything that uh, came up, but um, it's less clear what exotic means. But in our talk, to, well, in this talk today, I'll give you a definition in just a second. Um, starting with what a native species is. Um, we had um, a National Invasive Species Council. I'm actually not sure if that still exists anymore. Um, in fact, Damon Waite was on the National uh, Invasive Species Advisory Committee, and I do know that that committee uh, doesn't meet anymore. Um, but 
this is the definition that came up in 1999 with the executive order on invasive species. So this is essentially a native plant is one that occurs in the ecosystem within which it, um, it evolved. Um, an exotic species, on the other hand, is just the flip side of that, uh, where it's a plant growing in an area where pretty much it did not evolve. But an invasive exotic is an exotic plant whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And I think this is a great definition. It's comprehensive and I think covers um, all the bases. And as you might have guessed, there is variation in exotic plant impact. Um, this isn't invasive plant impact, this is exotic plant impact, all the way from um, this, the species that do not persist after cultivation, like the, the fruits and vegetables in the lower uh, left-hand image. Um, that was my, uh, many years ago, I grew a, um, a V8 garden and made gallons and gallons of V8 from these vegetables uh, and fruits. Um, but they're cultivated plants and pretty much by definition, uh, they depend on us humans for their survival. So you go down um, uh, this list and you get to the last one, which are the ones that are most troublesome, that spread into native habitats, change ecosystem function, alter composition or reduce natives. And those are the plants I'm talking about today, the truly invasive species. So let's stop for a second. Um, I think Ben's going to throw up a poll, um, and there you go. Hit your radio buttons. Can I play too? <laughs> no, sorry, Johnny, you can't play. <laughs> Great, so we still have some folks voting. So with about 90% of people voting, ooh, it looks like we're, we're pretty split on according to the previous definitions, can a native species be invasive? Okay, well, I would love, it, to, I would love to talk about that for a second. That'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> so I threw that up there kind of as a trick question. Um, and, uh, but it's something that comes up a lot. Um, can native species be invasive? Well, it depends on, of course, your definition of invasive. I and many others like to reserve the term invasive for non-native plants that have become invasive. Um, native plants, I like to call them either weedy or aggressive, all right? So native aggressive, invasive exotics, all right? So, um, and invasive has become kind of the, you know, the standard term for people who talk about non-native species that have become problematic, okay? So, um, the invasion curve. Uh, I've looked for the, um, the reference on this. I don't like to post things that um, I can't attribute um, easily. Um, but I don't know who to attribute this to, um, but it's out there on the internet. Um, and thank you for whoever put this together. Um, and I think it shows nicely, um, uh, graphically and figuratively, um, what is going on here. So in the y-axis, we have area infested, as also as control costs on the other y-axis over time. So you have introduction, and it takes a while for detection that this plant is becoming problematic. And then there's this nearly um, exponential curve where it becomes more and more um, uh, invasive, um, more and more, not necessarily invasive, but uh, it spreads rapidly into natural areas. Um, and it's only until uh, at, you know, high up on the curve that the public starts paying attention, like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, and if you let that go too long, then there's really no way of controlling that plant. Um, one term that's not on here, uh, which could be, um, but I've added, is um, this concept called a lag phase. So this is the period within which 
an invasive plant is kind of, it's figuring things out, uh, so to speak. Um, it's building up um, propagules in the environment. It's getting planted wide, widely um, by uh, people in their yards. And uh, so this lag phase is the period uh, where um, it's not spreading much, but the potential is growing tremendously. And here are some of the potential causes of invasiveness and this lag phase. Um, and I'll go through some of these, you know, like there's a benign environment where there are no pests and pathogens that might attack this plant. A short juvenile period, so a rapid life cycle. No seed pretreatment required. So a lot of plants uh, require, let's say, a fire or something like that, or passing through the gut of an animal um, for germination. Uh, many invasive plants require no pretreatment at all. Uh, novel environment, um, environment adaptation. So um, they can adapt rapidly to new environments. Increased pro propagule pressure. This refers to the number of seeds, for instance, in the seed bank that's building up um, over time. Uh, lack of pest pathogens, I've already discussed that. And then plant breeding. Um, there are some invasives that, uh, and kudzu is an example, actually, um, of a plant where aggressive traits were selected for. So the kudzu that occurs in its native habitats in Asia is not as aggressive as the kudzu that we have here in our country because it was chosen um, for erosion control. And so they wanted a very aggressive plant. And then hybridization with the native related species. So for example, um, uh, there are uh, a number of congeners um, of invasive plants that, uh, with North American relatives, and their hybrids are actually as much or more invasive than um, the, the non-native and uh, the native plant because it's using some of the traits of the native plant uh, to establish itself. Okay, so we'll go through that, uh, maybe um, talking about some of those things a little more. Now I'm using microstegium or stiltgrass as my first example. Um, this did not occur within my lifetime. Uh, obviously, um, in 1919 was when it was first detected in Tennessee, 1933 in North Carolina. But I use this as an example of a plant, how it has, the way it went through a lag phase and how it, um, uh, and how it um, probably spread throughout the Eastern United States uh, primarily. So I'm going to use these maps throughout my presentation. Um, so in the upper right hand corner is the um, BONAP map, the um, Bioda of North American program. So every, um, every little light blue dot is a county where an occurrence is recognized. And these are occurrences based on herbarium records. Um, so they are absolutely um, documented, uh, which is another reason herbaria are very important. Um, on the left are EDMAPs, the Early Detection and Distribution Map System. Everybody can do EDMAPs. Uh, there's an, uh, an app for your phone, and it's a great way for citizens to help um, build a database for where these invasive plants are. And you can see that the EDMAPs map of occurrences exceeds that of the BONAP map. So it's probably more accurate than BONAP because a lot of times, um, Non-native plants or exotics um, oftentimes aren't included um, as herbarium records. Now the bottom EDMAP map is the, um, the future certainty of spread. All right, now this is theoretical um, and uh, many of these um, maps that you'll see, these future spread maps, really aren't that accurate. It probably will spread much further than any of those maps demonstrate. And then there's the Radford et al. map uh, that you'll find in the Carolina flora. So this is the, the, what I'm gonna base the distribution of plants in the state um, at 1964. So back to Microstegium. Um, and it was fairly uncommon in central North Carolina until Hurricane Fran, Hurricane Francis in 1996. And you can see where that track went right up through the middle of North Carolina. 
And it was a, a terribly devastating um, thing for the Chapel Hill area. And um, these are some images I stole from the internet. Um, but there was widespread cleanup of this debris at just the right time of the year when microstegium was going to seed. And what happened to all this debris? It got picked up in yard waste. And what happened to that yard waste? It got ground up into mulch and compost. And then people went and got that free mulch and they took it home for their new landscape plants from their beat up landscape from Hurricane Fran. So um, there was this perfect storm for how I believe microstegium uh, really exploded um, after Hurricane Fran. So um, this is a typical cycle for any species, but particularly um, a weedy species where there's a colonization, then it's established, it spreads, so there's a disturbance and eruption, and then it colonizes again. This is a picture of Morgan Creek and the flood um, and uh, flood last year, it floods all the time. And almost every plant you see in that picture is microstegium. Um, so if it has seeds on it, those are getting washed downstream, distributed in floodplains, etc. So this is just an example of um, an eruption and uh, plant moving through lag phase very quickly. So question, for those of you who lived in central North Carolina before and after Hurricane Fran, did you notice a marked increase in microstegium? Hey, Johnny, I'm going to, just before I throw up this, do you mind addressing, we have two questions in the Q&A. Um, sure. So, um, Villamine, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name, um, but they are curious why wisteria is an invasive species here, but in their native country of the Netherlands, it's a desirable plant for gardens. Well, um, I can answer that hopefully uh, fairly simply. Um, so when a plantsman or a plantswoman goes to another location in the world to look for a plant that will do well, let's say here in Eastern North America, they go to places, they go to matched habitats. And um, Eastern Asia is, much of Eastern Asia is very much a matched habitat. We share probably 85% of the genera of plants between Eastern Asia and Eastern North America. And because of that, they brought wisteria to a matched habitat. In the Netherlands, it's struggling there. You know, this is essentially, you know, uh, Northeast Europe where it's cool and, um, and doesn't have the same conditions as here where wisteria really thrives like it does in its native habitat in Asia. Great, thanks, Johnny. Uh, one more from the question and answer. Deborah is asking, why are so many catalogs still selling invasives like honeysuckle and ligistrum, excuse my pronunciation, and is there a way to stop this? Okay, could you quickly repeat that? Yeah, it was why are so many catalogs still selling invasives like honeysuckle, and is there a way to stop this? <laughs> well, uh, that's a very good question, and we'll get to that um, uh, more and more as we go through this, but I'll simply, uh, I'll state two things. Number one, uh, we don't have a good risk assessment program. Well, we do have a good risk assessment program for uh, new introductions in this country. It's just that um, the nursery industry doesn't use it. Um, and the other thing is that <clears throat> um, people drive the market. So if people are buying honeysuckle, people are gonna, the nursery industry is gonna still make it available. So um, this is the power of the pocketbook, okay? If everyone stopped buying honeysuckle, it would no longer be available in the trade. Great, thanks, Johnny. Last question before I put up the poll about Hurricane Fran is, this comes from Sally. Sally's asking, is hellebore a non-native invasive plant in North Carolina? Well, it depends. Um, and I like to use the term invasive for plants that affect um, natural areas in a negative way. So I have probably, and so the house I live in now, uh, the person who lived here before planted helibores, and I have probably killed a fortune in helibores. It spreads like crazy. I am fortunate to live on the edge of a botanical garden <gasps> nature preserve 
and it has spread into that nature preserve. So helibores, if planted near a nature preserve or a natural area, would certainly be invasive. If you plant them in the middle of Chapel Hill, where it can't escape, then it's probably not invasive. However, uh, you have to make sure and not give any of those plants to anyone who might live next to a, a natural area. So um, that's kind of a roundabout answer and um, maybe not as clear as um, the questioner wanted. Great, thanks Johnny, really appreciate that. And thanks everyone for sending in your questions. So I'm gonna start the poll here for Johnny's question that he has up on his slideshow. So with about 85% of the vote in, looks like we have 37% yes, 6% no, 23% not sure, and then 34% not from the Central North Carolina area. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so maybe there is truth in what my observation was. Okay, so the first plant I want to pay uh, real attention to uh, in terms of a, a truly recent invasion is Ficaria verna. Uh, used to be called Ranunculus Ficaria, but commonly known as Fig Buttercup or Lesser Celandine. These are images, um, the one on the left is from uh, New Hope Creek. Um, and the one on the right is a little stream that feeds into Bolin Creek um, here in Chapel Hill, where uh, this plant is now just running rampant, okay? This is a plant that is certainly going through its lag phase here now. Um, it has taken over areas in the Northeast, and uh, we have the opportunity to turn back the tide if we all work together. So um, this was plant was not recognized in Radford, Allison Bell in 1964. Um, and, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have the Bonat map up, um, but I do have the EdMaps map and you can see that it is scattered um, in North Carolina. It has a tremendous potential to spread. But one thing that I think is nice is that its occurrence over time fits that invasion curve very nicely. These are different um, subspecies of Ficaria. Um, and um, yeah, it's exactly what has happened. Um, and if you look at 2000, um, it's really becoming more abundant. And this is uh, nationwide, not necessarily here in North Carolina, but that, um, but we definitely are in the detection phase right now and have a chance to roll it back. Um, it was actually the poster child um, for um, our North Carolina Invasive Plant Annual Meeting in 2018, which didn't happen this year, unfortunately. Um, and the, the hotel where we had the conference um, saw that there was a, uh, a ranunculus ficaria or, um, or ficaria uh, uh, um, variety called brazen hussy. And so they they at the bar, they made a special drink for the, that was reduced price um, called Brazen Hussy. So they have a new drink at this particular um, bar. But one thing that happened and is still happening with um, Ficaria is that it's often sold as marsh marigold, which is a very good native plant. So um, that is a real problem when a non-native invasive plant um, is mistaken for a native in the trade. So here we have um, um, Retnutria, um, the um, um, Japanese knotweed, which is typically known as. Uh, this is a plant that is truly, truly becoming a problem all over the country. Um, and it arrived in the United States um, um, in uh, the 1800s but it was 
not very common in North Carolina in 1964 when I started paying attention to plants. Um, I certainly never saw it there. You can see the Bonat map, uh, fairly widespread, EdMaps map, but look at the, um, the certainty of spread um, in the lower EdMaps map. And I wanna just, um, I know this is because bear with me on this, um, but this is EdMaps, starting uh, right now, we're at 1960, 61, two, three, four, et cetera. So you can watch the actual spread of this plant over time. Um, now we're in the, I just graduated from high school, yay, um, and in college, and started graduate school. I was in graduate Hi. school, yes? Excuse, excuse me, it's not showing that on the screen, but oh, I'm gonna I'm going to uh -oh. paste the link into the chat. Oh, I have to paste the link into the... I know will what? do that. I'll do that. Okay. Thank you. So, I won't be able to see what they're seeing, right? That's correct. Okay. That's okay. Just let me know when it's over. <laughs> I'm going to close my link, okay? Since That's it's fine. It's not showing on the share screen right now. Okay. So is that working or not? I am watching it on my computer. Hopefully folks have found that link in the chat and are able to watch it on their own. I see Arlene is saying, yes, I can see it. Kathy Cole says, can't see it. Okay. Well, I won't do any more of these animations, but um, these are really nice. Um, they, um, you'll have that link. Um, you can go look at it on your own. You can go to EdMaps and find some of these. Um, they really are dramatic um, how plants have been, or have established themselves and then gone through the lag phase and just started spreading like mad. Thanks, Johnny. And that link will be in the PDF that we'll send of your slides after okay. us. Okay, great. Um, Slate Magazine recently did an article on knotweed. Um, and uh, so here you have this reference. I'm not going to talk about it, but um, it's really a long article, but it's very informative. Um, and one thing that came out in this is that in England, if you have knotweed on your property, you can't sell it. It has to be eradicated before you can sell that property. So um, it has put a tremendous burden on homeowners, but it is um, something very, you know, very drastic, but, um, but why not? It's a bad plant. So I like this little cartoon, um, Granting Three Wishes. I'll let you read through that. Um, and I think if I had Aladdin's lamp for only a day, I might make some wishes just like this. Okay, next plant to look at is Akebia quinata, the chocolate vine, or um, I just, most people call it Akebia. Um, introduced in 1845 by Robert Fortune as an ornamental, but in 1964, it was a rare escape from cultivation established in woodlands and on road banks, Madison and Orange Counties, North Carolina. Um, the picture on this slide are, is botanical garden property across uh, right along Morgan Creek, where we have worked to get rid of it uh, to some extent. Uh, luckily, it spreads only vegetatively for the most part, it's self incompatible, but if you plant two different individuals of different genotypes, it will produce fruits um, that are spread. So um, it's still widely available in the trade. People love it. Um, and it has, as you can see, hopefully in that lower left-hand um, map, that it's um, certainty of spread um, looks pretty scary. Um, but right now it is still, fairly contained, but it is a very invasive plant. Please don't buy it. Perilla frutescens, the beefsteak plant. This is one, again, that 
I have watched actually within the last 10 years become invasive. Um, here's a picture of it um, with a nice backdrop of microstegium. Uh, they do make a nice color contrast, but I'll bet you can find other plants that do that too. Um, and uh, this is the current distribution and look at its future spread uh, potential. Really tremendous. Uh, we do a lot of eradication of this plant on botanical garden properties. And I don't believe it was in the Carolina flora. This is one that is uh, truly uh, worrisome. Um, Youngia japonica. Um, Asiatic hawk's beard is hard to say. Most people call it Youngia. Uh, no occurrences in 1964. And this is another plant that I recognized maybe 12, 14 years ago, um, becoming weedy around Chapel Hill. Then it invaded our natural areas along trails. Now it's invading openings and forests. So it's on the move. Um, it does very well in intact, shady ecosystems. Uh, we have, uh, we work very hard to keep it out of our Mason Farm Biological Reserve. Um, and it has just exploded. You can't walk 10 feet down a sidewalk in Chapel Hill without seeing one of these. Um, so this is um, the occurrence of Youngia, Edmaps, and its potential spread. It's just gone to seed. So it's a plant you have to look out for in late winter when it forms its basal rosette will start to green up and can be easily pulled, has a taproot, it's a biennial, uh, has a taproot, but you can, uh, you can gooch it out pretty easily. Um, uh, some people's favorite tool is a screwdriver. Garlic mustard. Uh, this is one that was pretty rare in the state in 1964 in alluvial, in alluvial woods and fields along the Dan River. All right. Uh, it has spread, it is really um, one of the worst plants in the, uh, the northeastern United States and it is spreading very rapidly in North Carolina, particularly the mountains, but we do have occurrences um, in the Piedmont as well. Uh, this was an intentional introduction like all of the others so far um, uh, for its, um, uh, people used it as a food plant. This is a nursery weed, hairy crab weed, and <clears throat> it was first reported in the US in 1969 um, but it is now classified as a noxious weed in North America. It was not, uh, it's not considered an, an ornamental by any means. And you do not find it in the nursery trade, except in the plants you buy from nurseries, because that's how it's being spread around. Um, this is a difficult plant to control. Um, and, uh, here's a picture of um, its occurrence, its future spread. Um, and uh, this was one, uh, there was a post on Facebook that came out of NC State just a couple of days ago. Um, uh, mulberry weed is another name for it. Joe Neal in the Department of Horticulture um, wrote about this and he talked about it primarily as a nursery weed. Um, but I need to call Joe and let him know that it is rapidly spreading into disturbed areas adjacent to natural areas and therefore it's only a matter of time before this does truly invade natural areas, especially in sites where um, there's a, a gap in a forest. So definitely something to look out for. And that's something you can look out for in plants that you buy from nurseries. Birds, who thought birds would be a problem? Um, Alfred Hitchcock did, obviously. Um, this is the North Carolina Wildflower Society um, or Native Plant Society's list of invasive species. And we, uh, I say we, um, at the North Carolina Botanical Garden and the North Carolina Invasive Plant Council are reevaluating this and will come out with a new list for the state pretty soon. Um, but I've put um, stars next to all the plants that are considered a uh, severe threat, invasive plants that are a severe threat or a significant threat that have bird dispersed fruits. Um, and as Batman is saying here to Robin, um, 
which is exactly what I've said to so many people who say, but, you know, I've got this plant in my yard. I'm just going to keep it here and, you know, I'll make sure and remove it before I move. But birds eat the fruits, carry them far and wide as a primary means of dispersals for so many native plants. And this is one that, uh, this is probably my poster child for the plant that I saw become invasive in my lifetime because, um, and these are pictures, every, all the pictures of invasive plants that I'm showing you are ones that I took, unless otherwise noted, and they're all taken in this area. Um, uh, this is across the, the creek uh, from my house, as well as in Duke Forest. So here I am um, in uh, approximately 1968. The red arrow shows a Mahonia at my house in Charlotte. And I think this was probably the last time I wore a tie um, too. But at any rate, um, I watched that plant move from a foundation planting to growing along a split rail fen fence to moving to neighbor's yards to, and it spread like crazy but it moved slowly but surely. Um, in 1964, um, it was pretty much a rare scape in woodlands and shrub borders in, in Orange County. Um, now, a lot of times you'll see that reference, Orange County or, or nearby counties um, in the Carolina flora. Um, it's because so many people were, I mean, that's where Al Radford and his team was located was at UNC Chapel Hill. So they did a lot more collecting around this area than other places. Um, so uh, this is probably a, um, an underrepresentation where it was in 1964, but nonetheless, a, a good reference. Johnny, inquiring minds want to know what's the doggy's name? <laughs> That's Tip. Um, and the dog to, uh, to my right in the, um, in the image is her son. His name was Trouble. We should have never named him that. So, um, Ampelopsis glandulosa uh, recently uh, changed from Ampelopsis brevipedunculata, uh, porcelain berry, common name. Uh, in 1964, occurring in waste places, rare, Beaufort and Orange Counties, North Carolina. So um, somebody from Chapel Hill went down to uh, the coast, went down to Beaufort and saw one there. So um, anyway, um, <clears throat> it is totally widespread in the Northeast. This is a plant that we battle regularly at the Mason Farm Biological Reserve. And I dare say, it may be the epicenter for uh, local infestations because it was planted when the Soil Conservation Service used Mason Farm as a, um, a trial nursery back in the 1950s. So um, there are a number of plants that they planted um, that have spread, including um, uh, this, um, this buckthorn that's not native that is a very troublesome shrub. So the Bonat map, of Ampelopsis in the upper right, uh, Ed Maps showing current distribution according to observational data, and then uh, the, the likely future spread. And this is way underrepresents the spread because um, it occurs through much of North Carolina. And we know it's in Bur Beaufort County and Orange Counties, um, and that doesn't show on the, the Ed Maps. Oriental bittersweet. Uh, this is the edge of Mason Farm where it's draped with um, uh, Celastrus. Uh, this is particularly troublesome in our area and um, in the mountains, especially along Blue Ridge Parkway um, and, and also in the Northeast. Um, fairly rare in 1964, um, introduced in 1860 um, but really didn't get to um, North Carolina for quite a while. Uh, Larry Melichamp, um, uh, one of my mentors, told me that he thinks he found, he saw the first one um, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And I asked him, well, why didn't you pull it up? Uh, and I think a lot of people have asked him that question. 
So it is spread around in many different ways. Um, I mean, birds for sure, but also um, this is now considered a class C noxious weed in North Carolina, meaning that um, it can't be sold out outside of these quarantine uh, counties. Everybody knows what quarantine means now. So uh, it means it has to stay in those counties. Uh, it's because there's a cottage industry that makes wreaths out of this for Christmas. Um, and it's not supposed to be taken out of those counties, but of course, um, there's no one really enforcing that. Uh, the picture of it you know, with the pumpkins is one that I took from um, our local Whole Foods. Um, my wife came back one day and said, they're selling a real bittersweet at Whole Foods. I went, oh my goodness. So I went and checked it out, talked to the manager, told him that it was against the law, but most importantly, he wanted to be um, responsible um, and not sell it. Someone had requested it. Um, and he got in touch with all of the, um, the Whole Foods uh, managers and the rest of the state, uh, told them that they should not carry this plant because it's illegal and also because it's a, a bad actor. Um, but how does this get spread around? People put it in their garbage, people put it in their compost. Um, here's this lovely lady who's made a Oriental Bittersweet um, wreath. And what do you think you do with that when it's over? You throw it in your own compost or solid or the, um, the, gar the lawn waste, the yard waste um, that then gets redistributed around town. Cal repair, Bradford pear. This is a, the lower picture is a picture of um, Merritt Pasture, town of Chapel Hill land on which um, our North Carolina Botanical Garden holds a conservation easement. And I'm working or we're working with the town to remove it from there. But this is definitely a plant that is on a lot of people's minds right now. Um, it was billed as um, would not produce fruits because at first there was only one genotype of this plant. Now there are many different genotypes. And when there's cross pollination, fruits form and then they get dispersed by birds. Um, this is a plant that was promoted when I was in college um, in, the night, in the early 70s. Um, and it was so widely planted and overplanted. Um, and now it's, um, it's really very problematic. It was not in the Carolina floor by any means um, in 1964. And that future spread is um, probably well under represents where calorie pair will spread. Uh, that's a picture of the plant um, in an abandoned farm field. And you can drive through Orange and Durham counties and see this exact same thing, um, where once it gets into an area, you have two trees, you have three trees, you have five trees, you have 50 trees, you have a thousand trees. It really increases exponentially. So question, what are we to do? Well, here's the answer. There are a number of places you can go for resources. Um, of course, our Botanical Garden website, if you go under the plants tab, you can get lots of information about invasive plants, how to remove them. In fact, this Controlling Invasive Plants booklet features the worst invasives in our area and the best way to get rid of them. But there's also um, native plant recommendations um, on our website. NC State has a great website called Going Native, um, and it promotes plants that are indeed um, uh, good for the world um, and not bad for the world, and also ones that are um, uh, useful for wildlife. Uh, Chris Mormon, who put this site together, um, is in the Department of Forestry, but he's primarily um, an ornithologist. Um, so he really does concentrate on birds and what's best for birds. And there's lots of information on our North Carolina Invasive Plant Council um, webpage. So you can just Google that. Um, certainly, our local Audubon Society has done a lot promoting um, bird friendly plants. And a great gift for anyone or any of Doug Ptolemy's books. This was his first one bringing up the idea of the problem that native plant, that invasive plants were causing and bringing nature home. So, to wrap it up, in my lifetime, I need to be able to read that. 
I want risk assessment required for all new introductions, expanded and funded control eradication programs, and public education on the importance of native plant landscaping and biodiversity protection. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate it. We've got a lot of questions that have come in. So if, if folks have a few minutes, um, I'm going to try to kind of summarize some of these questions so we can get to as many as we can. So Johnny, there's a number of questions in the chat um, around transportation and propagation. Um, so for example, Barbara is asking, how is brazen hussy transported or propagated? And it says that some of it has appeared in their garden. I'm not sure if it's moving around by seeds. Um, it is primarily moving around by um, something called, whoops, a bulbul, um, which occurs on the above ground portion of the, the stem um, that break off very easily and are moved around just by water or by gravity, rainfall. Um, but it also has these tubers um, uh, attached to the roots, which are, um, I mean, that's why, unfortunately, it's very difficult to dig this plant out because you have to dig so much of it to get that tuber out. Then you need to screen the soil to make sure you don't leave any of those tubers um, in uh, the soil. But yes, indeed, I don't think it was planted in my landscape, but I, um, I had an infestation of it in my own yard. And I don't know how it got here. Probably um, uh, being washed in from a neighbor's yard. It's my best guess. Great, thanks, Johnny. Another question uh, kind of related, a few folks are asking, if you uh, remove an invasive species, uh, how do you dispose of them properly? And on the same kind of uh, trend here, if, they, if someone has a Mahonia on their property, should they remove it? Okay, so um, it's fine to put invasive plants into the yard waste as long as they don't have fruits or seeds on them. So let's just use Mahonia as an example. Um, let's say it has fruits on it and I think you should remove it. Um, it had, you know, I think it has, it adds little to a landscape. You know, it's a mean plant. It has stickers on the leaves. Um, I don't think it's particularly attractive and there are plenty of other plants that can be planted instead of it that are useful ecologically and aesthetically, but cut the fruits off, put that in the landfill waste and you can yank the rest of the plant out of the ground and put it in the yard waste. So that's really important to know. Um, and because you don't want to spread any of these plants around in the compost that you might get from the county. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Johnny. An interesting question from Cal came through um, asking about global warming and increasing CO2 levels and if you think those have helped many of these invasive species. Well, there is some evidence that uh, some are benefited, but um, I'm... Uh, so one thing that I think CO2 is benefiting across the board are vines. Um, and there are a lot of invasive plants that are vines. Um, in fact, um, that's one of the top 10 characteristics of a plant um, uh, that gives it the potential for becoming invasive is if it's a vine, a woody vine. They tend to be, um, um, uh, they have that potential for invasiveness. So I know vines for sure, increasing CO2 can benefit them. Um, and we have a lot of invasive vines out there. Thanks, Johnny. I'm going to keep getting to as many questions as we can here. Thanks, everyone, for staying on here a little bit past one. Um, so Katie has asked a question, are naturalized plants considered invasive, and are they detrimental to ecosystems? Well, I assume you mean um, if it's a naturalized non-native. So in my mind, the definition of invasive, well, that can be a definition of an invasive plant if it has naturalized um, in a natural area because um, 
That means that it um, is taking the place of something else. Um, it means that, uh, and when I say something else, another plant um, that is native that might benefit the world, uh, most non-native plants can't be used by our native uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars. Therefore, that plant is worthless. Um, sometimes they produce fleshy fruits that birds eat. Um, many studies have shown that um, a lot of the non-native invasive plants um, that we have, um, that have become uh, invasive in the landscape are really high in carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates in the fruits. And so migrating birds, for instance, are eating candy bars instead of cheeseburgers. Um, many of, most of our native plants have fruits that are high in um, lipids, proteins and um, and other fats so um, so yes natural naturalized non natives are invasive in my book thanks Johnny um, sherry thanks for being so patient sherry asked one how did you kill the hellebore um, when you were speaking about that and removing it and how can we get the town of Chapel Hill to kill the fig buttercup <laughs> so um, Gila bores, uh, you can use a herbicide on them, but they have a really waxy leaf. Um, so that's one way to do it. But I'm, I'm digging them up um, and discarding them. Uh, and so, like I said, I have, I have dug up and destroyed a fortune in Gila bores. Um, and, uh, but what's, if you have a lot of them, it's hard to dig them all up at once. So um, you can just take your time digging them up getting rid of them, but make sure that they don't flower and uh, go to seed because um, seedlings come up everywhere. You'll notice around the base of a plant that it has this whole apron of hundreds of seedlings from uh, the season before. Great, thanks, Johnny. A few questions on species hybridizing. Um, so one, Cal's asking, is the virgin's bower is that a native aggressive, an invasive exotic, or both, and possibly two species hybridizing? I'm not sure if that is hybridizing or not, but um, that is an invasive vine, um, uh, but it's not as invasive as some. Uh, so, um, so that's the best I can answer that question, I'm sorry. Great, thanks, Johnny. Um, another, someone has asked, curious if Nandina is considered invasive also? That's another plant I could have used um, for in my lifetime, seeing it spread. Um, I now see it coming up in natural areas. Um, yes, it is an invasive plant um, and it's one truly on the move. Um, and so um, it's one I don't recommend people plant and there's also evidence that, um, and this is something I haven't quite wrapped my head around, um, but there are uh, published papers on how the fruits um, have killed birds. And I think this is mostly in cedar waxwings that will eat a bunch of fruits at one time. And I think that um, for birds that will really stuff themselves on um, a particular fruit, um, Nandina is toxic. Maybe birds in Asia aren't affected by the toxins in it. I don't know. It doesn't make sense ecologically and evolutionarily that a plant would produce a fruit that would poison its disperser. So um, I'm not totally uh, convinced on this yet. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, but I am sure that it's moving around in the landscape, whether it's truly poisonous to uh, lots of birds, I don't know, but um, it's definitely one to, to remove, I believe. Thanks, Johnny. Um, get to a question um, that Ed had, and Ed, please forgive me if I butcher the Latin name here. Um, Ed asks, is, my understanding is that Pyrrhus calorana fruits hybridize with desirable fruit pear trees, resulting in vigorous spreads with inedible fruits. Do you know if this is the case? 
Yes, uh, there is evidence that um, cow repair is hybridizing with um, other pyrus species, including um, our natives. But as far as um, the progeny from that um, being particularly uh, invasive, I'm not sure anyone has studied that. Great, thanks, John. I'm gonna to get to one last question from Arlene. Um, Arlene's got kind of a two-part question. One is, what measures would prevent the berries from propagating? And I think this came in when you were talking about the oriental bittersweet. Um, and then the second part of this question are, do invasive plant lists include eradication information? With respect to the first question, um, usually, Really high temperatures will kill uh, kill fruits and seeds. So if um, I know that Mecklenburg County used to do hot composting of their yard waste, and I knew the person pretty well who ran that whole program, and she found the only plant that could get through that hot, com hot composting were tomato seeds, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but um, but yeah, I think that if you um, hot compost or put them in your oven at 250 degrees for 30 minutes probably, but, um, but I think the safest thing to do is to put those in the landfill. Um, even though that is not um, allowed in our area to put uh, plant material in uh, the landfill waste, but if you're just putting the reproductive parts of, um, of an invasive plant uh, inside the, the yard waste. I, I mean, the, the landfill waste, I think that's fine. Just don't stuff your whole uh, giant um, privet in there. Was there a to that question? What was that, Johnny? I'm sorry. Was there a second part to that question? Oh, the follow-up was just do eradication or invasive plant lists include eradication information? Uh, what well, depends on the, the list. Um, usually uh, there is information associated with eradication on, um, on sites, websites, and organizational uh, materials um, that produce lists. But I think our... Um, our control guide um, is really good. Um, it's uh, downloaded as a PDF and um, yeah, you've got it. All right, thank you all. We're gonna call it uh, the end there. These questions are great and I know you all probably have many more and uh, you're welcome as Johnny mentioned to reach out to him by email and uh, send those questions along to him as well. Johnny, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming on and doing this uh, virtual lunchbox talk as a webinar with us. Um, when you all close out of Zoom, you'll be taken to a new browser window with a survey. We hope that you will give us feedback on how these are going and, and your ideas for how we can serve you in the virtual environment moving forward. It will be part of our new normal at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And please sign up for future events with us, uh, including the Carolina Moonlight Virtual Party. So we look forward to seeing all or many of you there. And with that, I'll say goodbye.